Hello. In this video, I'm going to turn my attention to talking about undertaking reasonableness review. As you will now be aware, the decision in Vavilov made substantial changes to the framework of substantive review of administrative action. This, as you have seen, included a substantial simplification, a controversial one at that, of the question of which test should apply. As you have seen, Vavilov finally brought to an end the functional and pragmatic approach, or standard of review analysis, as it was renamed in Dunsmuir. Instead, Vavilov ushered in a new era of presumption-based analysis, which in a previous video I characterised as a rediscovery of some of the virtues of formalism. If not a return to the old formalism, which was couched in terms of impugning decision makers for directing their minds to the wrong question or making errors going to jurisdiction, it was at least an acceptance that formalism had some virtues and these were born out of a desire to prevent the courts engaging in a wide-ranging contextual inquiry in every case. The majority decision in Vavilov sought to accomplish this through a presumption that judicial review on substantive grounds will be conducted or according to the reasonableness standard, albeit that this presumption is rebuttable in a number of specific situations. The main focus of this video is going to be on the guidance that Vavilov offers in terms of conducting reasonableness review itself after that standard has been decided upon. But before I get to that, it is worth reminding ourselves of why the court felt it necessary for the second time in just over a decade to fundamentally rethink the issues of the standard of review analysis itself. If we go back for a moment to the 2008 case of Dunsmuir, Justices Bastarash and LaBelle said at paragraph 43, the court has moved from a highly formalistic artificial jurisdiction test that could easily be manipulated to a highly contextual functional test that provides great flexibility but little real world on the ground guidance and offers too many standards of review. What is needed is a test that offers guidance, is not formalistic or artificial, and permits review where justice requires it, but not otherwise. A simpler test is needed. It was hoped that by simplifying the test and reducing the number of standards of review from three to two, these needs could be met. One of the dissenters in that case, though, Justice Binney, skewered the unspoken premise on which this hope was based. He said, The theory of our recent case law has been that once the appropriate standard of review is selected, it is a fairly straightforward matter to apply it. But this has not proved to be the case. One of the criticisms of pragmatic and functional era jurisprudence as highlighted by Justice Binney's remarks, is that it was too focused on which test to apply when, and not sufficiently focused on giving guidance to lower courts on how reasonable review should actually be conducted, or correctness review for that matter, and it was felt that the simplification brought about by Dunsmuir had not solved this issue entirely. So, while the first issue addressed in Vavilov was to reconsider yet again the question of which test should apply, the court also addressed a second aspect, namely the need for better guidance from this court, as the majority put it, on the proper application of the reasonableness standard. This second aspect can be found in paragraphs 73 to 142 of the judgment. So what does this guidance consist of? The question will take up most of the rest of this video, but first I want to return once more to the earlier law as stated in Dunsmuir. Reasonableness, according to the majority there, is concerned mostly with the existence of justification, transparency and intelligibility within the decision-making process and with whether the decision falls within a range of possible acceptable outcomes which are defensible in respect of the facts and the law. Those two limbs of Dunsmuir went together, 
the obligation on administrative decision makers to render decisions that are justifiable, transparent and intelligible alongside an approach of the court that was deferential to the reasoning and decisional outcomes of administrative bodies. In many ways, in Vavilov, the Supreme Court of Canada has doubled down on these two limbs. As the majority put it at paragraph 14, on the one hand, courts must recognise the legitimacy and authority of administrative decision makers within their proper spheres and adopt the appropriate posture of respect. On the other hand, administrative decision makers must adopt a culture of justification and demonstrate that their ex exercise of delegated public power can be justified to citizens in terms of rationality and fairness. As we shall see, however, the court has deprecated the approach to reasonableness review that involved assessing whether decisions were within a range of possible and defensible outcomes. So what guidance does the Supreme Court of Canada now offer in terms of conducting reasonableness review? Well, Vavilov takes as the paradigmatic situation one where the decision maker is under a duty to give reasons, and its guidance falls under five headings. We will consider each of these in detail, but first I will give just the headlines. First, the decision of the court clarifies the relationship between procedural fairness, particularly in relation to the giving of reasons, and substantive review. Second, the court says, a court conducting a reasonableness review properly considers both the outcome of the decision and the reasoning process that led to the outcome. Third, the court emphasises that reasonableness is a single standard that accounts for context. Fourth, formal reasons for a decision should be read in the light of the record and with due sensitivity to the administrative setting in which they were given. And fifth, the court emphasises that a reasonable decision is one that is both based on internally coherent reasoning and justified in light of the legal and factual constraints that bear on the decision. We will consider each of these in turn before looking at the situation where a decision maker does not have a duty to give reasons. In paragraph 76 to 81 of Vavilov, the majority considers the relationship between the duty to give reasons, where such a duty exists, and the role of the reviewing court in performing reasonableness review. The majority cites a number of ways which giving of reasons improves the administrative process as well as facilitates the process of judicial review. Notwithstanding the important differences between the administrative and the judicial context, it says, reasons generally serve many of the same purposes in the former as in the latter. These include explaining how and why a particular decision was made, demonstrating to the party that their arguments have been considered and the decision was made in a fair and unlawful manner, providing a shield against arbitrariness as well as counting, countering any perceptions of arbitrary decision making. The process of drafting reasons also necessarily encourages administrative decision makers to more carefully examine their own thinking and to better articulate their analysis in the process. Finally, reasons facilitate meaningful judicial review by shedding light on the rationale for a decision, demonstrating the justification, transparency and intelligibility of a decision, which, as we saw from Dunsmuir, is the hallmark of a reasonable decision. You should now pause this video and read paragraphs 79 to 82 of Vavilov. I am now assuming that you have read paragraphs 79 to 82 of Vavilov. As you will have seen, after citing these factors to which the giving of reasons contribute, the court concludes, The starting point for our analysis is therefore that where reasons are required, they are the primary mechanism by which administrative decision makers show their that their decisions are reasonable, 
both to the affected parties and to the reviewing courts. It follows that the provision of reasons for an administrative decision may have implications for its legitimacy, including in terms both of whether it is procedurally fair and whether it is substantively reasonable. This is the important bit because it links the court's jurisprudence on procedural fairness with its guidance on reasonableness review. The link, of course, is that it is through the examination of reasons that the reviewing court assesses whether the decision was or was not reasonable. In paragraphs 82 to 87 of Vavilov, the majority makes an argument, and in doing so instructs lower courts, that reasonable review properly considers both the outcome of the decision and the reasoning process that led to that outcome. As far as the reasoning process is concerned, the court emphasises at paragraph 83 that the role of courts in these circumstances is to review and they are, at least as a general rule, to refrain from deciding the issue themselves. You should also note that the Supreme Court of Canada departs from what it said about understanding reasonableness review in previous case law, including Dunsmuir. Not only should the court refrain from substituting its own view of the decision, it, sh it should not even, as Dunsmuir suggested, attempt to assess whether the decision is within the range of decisions that are legally permissible. Rather, the reviewing court must consider only whether the decision made by the administrative decision maker, including the, both the rationale for the decision and the outcome to which it led, was unreasonable. How does the reviewing court then know if a decision is reasonable? As the majority put it at paragraph 85, a reasonable decision is one that is based on an internally coherent and rational chain of analysis and that is justified in relation to the fact and law that constrain the decision maker. Provided that a decision maker meets these standards, the reviewing court defers to the decision of an administrative body. In this respect, the standard of reasonableness as set out in Vavilov is consistent with that of Dunsmuir. Like Dunsmuir, Vavilov emphasises that reasonable review is concerned with ensuring that decisions of administrative agencies live up to standards of justification, transparency and intelligibility. But it is interesting and important to note that Vavilov places the emphasis on decisions being actually justified rather than simply being capable of justification. It is not enough for the outcome of a decision to be justifiable, it must actually be justified. As the majority puts it at paragraph 86, where reasons for a decision are required, the decision must also be justified by way of those reasons, by the decision maker to those who, to whom the decision applies. While some outcomes may be so at odds with the legal and factual context that they could never be supported by intelligible and rational reasoning, an otherwise reasonable outcome also cannot stand if it was reached on an improper basis. You should now read paragraphs 82 to 87 of Vavilov, noting as you do the points that I have just emphasised. OK, now that you have read paragraphs 82 to 87 of Vavilov, I will now turn to the argument made by the majority that reasonableness is a single standard that accounts for context. I think that this heading of discussion in Vavilov makes most sense if you consider it in the context of the history of reasonableness review. This started with the standard of patent unreasonableness in QP the discovery of an intermediate standard of reasonableness simpliciter in Pesim and Southam, and their conflation into one reasonableness standard in Dunsmuir. Quite simply, the court is trying to draw a line under the previous development of different tests, and to say that where the reasonableness standard applies, that, it, that is it as far as the debate about which test applies. This can also be seen in the context of Justice Binney's remarks in Dunsmuir, 
about getting the parties away from arguing about the tests and back to arguing about the substantive merits of their case. It might be seen as within the spirit of this injunction to discuss how a test applies in particular circumstances and that this is different from debating which test to apply. So what did the court actually say in Vavilov? First, at paragraph 88, the court acknowledges the variety of types of decision makers and types of decisions that comprise the administrative state. But as the majority put it at paragraph 89, Despite this diversity, reasonableness remains a single standard and elements of a decision's context do not modulate the standard or the degree of scrutiny by the reviewing court. Instead, the particular context of a decision constrains what will be reasonable for an administrative decision maker to decide in a given case. But despite the majority's insistence that reasonableness is a single standard and that elements of the decision's context do not modulate the standard or the degree of scrutiny, they acknowledge that the approach to reasonableness review recognises, as they put it, that is what is reasonable in a given situation will always depend on the constraints imposed by the legal and factual context of the particular decision under review. They continue. These contextual constraints dictate the limits and contours of the space in which the decision maker may act and the types of solution it may adopt. The fact that the contextual constraints operating on an administrative decision maker may vary from one decision to another does not pose a problem for the reasonableness standard because each decision must be both justified by the administrative body and evaluated by the reviewing courts in relation to its own particular context. To me, this makes sense if you come back to the majority starting point. Since scrutiny proceeds from an examination of reasons and justifications given by the primary decision, these themselves should show the requisite awareness of the legal and factual context of the decision. And this is something that the courts can examine in reasonableness review. Now read paragraphs 88 to 90 of Vavilov. After you have done this, we will consider the next item of guidance, which is that formal reasons for a decision should be read in the light of the record with due sensitivity to the administrative setting in which they were given. Before we get into details of this item of guidance in Vavilov, it is worth pausing to revise what we mean by the record of a decision. Historically, this was a very important term, as it was only if an error of law appeared on the face of the record that the court could annul a decision of an inferior body. The reviewing court could call for the record, which might, depending on the circumstances, include the submission of the parties, minutes of the meetings at which the decision was taken, if these were produced, of course, relevant policies or procedures adopted by the decision maker, and past decisions of the administrative body. In English law, under the influence of de Plockian judicial review, the courts have moved away from calling for the record. Lord Diplock felt that if such materials were available, judges would be drawn into deciding matters of policy rather than bare legality. However, calling for the record is still the basic technique by which the court conducts judicial review in US administrative law. So what is the court getting at in Vavilov in emphasising that reason should be read in the light of the record? You can read what the court has to say at paragraphs 91 to 98 of Vavilov, and I recommend that you do that now. First of all, the majority says at paragraph 91, that reasons for a decision should not be assessed against a standard of perfection. Instead, they should be read in the light of the institutional context and the history of the proceedings. What I think the majority is getting at is that administrative decision makers bring specialist expertise and their inquiry may well be conducted in terms of that specialist expertise. In particular, Administrative bodies often may not undertake a comprehensive analysis, but zero in on one particular factor or a few factors as relevant to the decision. 
They may use concepts and language that will often be highly specific to their fields of experience and expertise, as the majority says, and this may impact both on the form and content of their reasons. The majority is saying that this is not evidence that a decision maker's reasoning is perfunctory just because it focuses in on this way. On the contrary, this may be regarded as evidence of the de decision maker's specialist expertise because it shows understanding of the factors that are in context likely to be relevant to the policy outcomes or objectives they are supposed to be pursuing. As the majority puts it, respectful attention to a decision maker's demonstrated expertise may reveal to a reviewing court that an outcome that might be puzzling or counterintuitive on its face nevertheless accords with the purposes and practical realities of the relevant administrative regime and represents a reasonable approach given the consequences and the operational impact of the decision. The majority adds at paragraph 92 that administrative justice will not always look like judicial justice and reviewing courts must remain acutely aware of this bad fact. Equally, the history of proceedings might provide a perfectly valid explanation of why certain matters were not addressed in reasons for a decision. But on the other hand, if the reasoning of an administrative body contains a fundamental gap or suggests that the decision is based on an unreasonable chain of analysis, the reviewing court is not supposed to fill in the gaps even if it thinks a decision is capable of justification. This is consistent with the idea that reasonable review is a review of the reasons actually given, and with the idea that the reviewing court should not substitute its decision for that of the administrative body. The idea is that it would be just as much of a substitution, if you like, to substitute reasons that save the decision from irrationality as it would be to substitute reasons which condemn it. Finally, in terms of the guidance on reasonableness review, the majority considers two different kinds of failure of rationality. The first one is where there is a failure of rationality internal to the reasoning process. The second is where the decision is untenable in the light of the legal and factual circumstances. The first of these is considered at paragraphs 102 to 104 of Vavilov, and I recommend that you read those paragraphs now. Okay, I am now assuming that you have read paragraphs 102 to 104. There are a couple of things worth noting. First, it is not the case that any little flaw in the reasoning will impugn a decision. Reasonable review is not, as the court put it, a line-by-line -line treasure hunt for error, and the reviewing court should not expect administrative decision-makers to be academic logicians. What is required is that the reviewing court should be able to trace the administrative decision-makers' chain of reasoning without encountering any fatal flaws in the overarching chain of logic. And consistent with the idea of inculcating a culture of justification, transparency and intelligibility, the court disapproves of reasonings that is formulaic. I hope you're beginning to see how the approach in, of the court in Vavilov is demanding more of reviewing courts in terms of deference to primary decision makers, in return for which more is being demanded of primary decision makers by way of justification for their decisions. The second aspect that the majority considers as part of a reasonable decision is, as I have stated, that it should be justifiable in terms of the legal and factual constraints on the decision. The court cites a non-exhaustive list of eight elements which will generally be irrelevant in evaluating whether a decision is reasonable. I am not going to discuss these in detail. I will simply list them, and you can read them in more detail as and when you find it necessary. You will find them at paragraphs 108 to 135 of Vavilov. These are the governing statutory scheme, other statutory or common law, principles of interpretation, evidence before the decision maker, 
submission of the parties, past practices and decisions, and finally, the impact of the decision on the affected individual. So far, we have been considering the paradigmatic case in which reasons for a decision are given, and the reviewing court approaches the task of reasonableness review in terms of an assessment of the reasons for the decision, as well as the outcome. But there are, as the majority acknowledges in Vavilov, many situations in which administrative decision makers are not required to give reasons. So far, we have been considering the paradigmatic case in which reasons for a decision are given, and the reviewing court approaches the task of reasonableness review in terms of an assessment of the reasons for the decision, as well as the outcome. But there are, as the majority acknowledges in Vavilov, many situations in which administrative decision makers are not required to give reasons. How should the reviewing court approach re reasonableness review in the absence of a statement of the reasons for the decision? In what might be regarded as an understatement, the majority in Vavilov states, admittedly, Applying an approach to judicial review that prioritises the decision maker's justification for its decision can be challenging in cases in which formal reasons have not been provided. But having conceded that ground, it pretty much sticks to its guns. The majority adds, even in such circumstances, the reasoning process that underlies the decision will not usually be opaque. The majority emphasises again that reasonableness review should be read in the light of the record and gives the example of Catalyst, in which the reasons for a municipal bylaw were readily inferred from debates, deliberations and statements of policy, including the municipality's five-year plan. But where reasons cannot be inferred from the record, the reviewing court would look not to the reasoning of the decision-maker but to the outcome and on the legal and factual constraints on the decision maker that we have just discussed. You should now read for yourself what the majority in Vavilov says about reasonableness review in the absence of decisions. Their analysis can be found in paragraphs 136 to 138 of the decision. This concludes my detailed exegesis of the guidance contained in Vavilov on conducting reasonableness review. I have focused on this case in particular because, as the majority pointed out, prior to Vavilov there really wasn't much guidance at all on conducting reasonableness review, as distinct from determining whether reasonableness or correctness review applied. And what guidance as did exist was not collected in one place in convenient form. Vavilov now does this. There are a number of evaluative questions we can ask about the majority decision in Vavilov, not least of which is whether it will bring the simplicity and certainty that it seeks to, and whether the guidance it provides will prove as helpful to lower courts and to administrative decision makers, individuals and counsel as it holds. I imagine that Vavilov will turn out not to be the last word on reasonableness review, but it is the latest word, so it is worth paying close attention to the decision, as I have done. I hope you found reading the decision as thought-provoking as I have, and that you managed to digest the relevant passages. I will see you in the next video, when I will look at conducting correct this review. But for now, goodbye.